Hello, Balissa. Hi. Welcome to a brand new Mindset Learn series. In this series, we'll be exploring the Earth's atmosphere. Planet Earth is a fascinating place. As far as we know, it's the only planet revolving around our sun that sustains life. Can you think why this is? Think about the components that are necessary for the well-being of humankind on this planet for a minute. Balisa, what did you come up with? Well, the sun gives us heat and light, and then there's the water that we drink and the air that we breathe. <laughs> That's very good, Balisa. The sun's energy is essential for our survival, and the atmosphere is essential too, because as you pointed out, it provides us with the gases that we need to breathe. Water is essential for drinking, for plants to grow, and for some forms of life to live and breathe in. We also need the lithosphere for animals to move about on and to burrow into and for the soil in which plants grow. You should remember that the three spheres, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere and the lithosphere of the earth interact with each other in a series of important chemical cycles to create a space where life can exist. This space is called the biosphere. Although there are many factors that ensure that life is sustained on Earth, in this series we will only focus on the Earth's atmosphere. The atmosphere is essential for the maintenance of important cycles like the carbon and nitrogen cycles and of course the water cycle which ensures we have an ongoing supply of clean water. Physical conditions in the atmosphere like pressure, temperature, wind and humidity affect life on Earth as they vary from time to time and place to place. And of course, the atmosphere protects the Earth from certain very harmful radiation from the sun that would otherwise burn us to a crisp. In this series, we'll be looking at some of the characteristics of the atmosphere and the processes that take place within it and why they're so important to our planet. We'll also be looking at some of the activities of people that impact on the atmosphere and we'll also examine the consequences of these for our well-being. In this lesson, we'll be looking at the chemical composition of the atmosphere and the different ways to describe its structure. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to describe the structure of the atmosphere with reference to temperature and interpret a temperature altitude graph. When we talk about an atmosphere, we are talking about a blanket of gas particles that is held in place around a planet because of the planet's gravitational field. The size and the elemental makeup of the planet, as well as the planet's distance from the sun, helps to determine which gases make up the planet's atmosphere. Quite a few of the planets in our solar system have some kind of atmosphere, but as far as we know, none of them sustain life as Earth does. The Earth's atmosphere is most dense close to the surface and becomes less and less dense as altitude increases. As a matter of fact, most of our atmosphere's mass is found within an 11 kilometer radius from the surface. The region of the Earth's atmosphere that reaches from the surface to an altitude of about 80 kilometers is called the homosphere. Now, research has shown that the chemical composition of the homosphere remains pretty much constant. The only component that varies considerably is the water vapor content. Now, we're going to look at a diagram that will show us exactly which gases you'll find in the homosphere and in what proportions they're occurring. The dry air in the atmosphere is composed of about 78% nitrogen molecules and 21% oxygen molecules. Argon atoms and carbon dioxide molecules make up most of the remaining 1%. A number of other gases exist in smaller quantities or trace amounts but are just as important. Nitrous oxide, methane, helium, krypton, neon, xenon, hydrogen and ozone are all present. The amount of water vapor in the atmosphere depends on climate and changing weather conditions. Because it changes so much, it is not taken into consideration when we calculate the chemical composition of the atmosphere. The region above the homosphere is called the heterosphere. In the heterosphere, the chemical composition varies according to molecular weight. The heterosphere can roughly be divided into four thinner layers or shells. 
The lower shell is dominated by nitrogen molecules. Next, you find a shell where you will find mostly atomic oxygen or O. Then a shell with mostly helium atoms and finally a shell consisting of atomic hydrogen. Do you see the size and the mass of the particles that dominate each of the shells of the heterosphere become smaller and smaller the further we go into space? Yes, I do. But I'm confused about something else. When we learnt about the atmosphere and its layers, I'm sure we called them something else. Shouldn't there be a stratosphere somewhere? Or am I totally off track? No, Balisa, you're not off track. You see, the region's heterosphere and homosphere describe the chemical composition of the atmosphere. But the atmosphere can also be described in relation to the temperature changes that occur in the different regions. That's where the stratosphere comes in. That sounds a bit strange. Wouldn't it get colder and colder the higher you go? Well, that's exactly what most people would expect. But after temperature measurements from weather balloon flights, we now know that the atmosphere can be divided into four layers based on temperature. As I describe them to you, try to imagine what you would see in each layer if you could fly through space. The densest layer of gas closest to the Earth's surface is called the troposphere. The average temperature at the Earth's surface, an altitude of zero kilometers, is about 14 degrees Celsius. As you head up and away from the Earth, you should start to see some interesting cloud formations. Our weather happens in the troposphere and in the lower part of the next layer. Water molecules collect and join up in clouds. Rain, snow, sleet and freezing rain then fall back to the surface. Winds also occur in the troposphere. You should try to avoid the cumulonimbus clouds if you can. There is a lot of air turbulence and heavy precipitation around these formations. It should get better when you reach the cruising altitudes of most Boeing 747 passenger jet planes at about 9,000 meters. Perhaps you'll even get a peak at Mount Everest at 8,848 meters. It's the tallest mountain in the world. It's getting cold up here, minus 52 degrees Celsius, as you get 15 kilometers above Earth. You have now reached the edge of the troposphere and are passing through a narrow layer called the tropopause. This is the thin boundary layer between the troposphere and the next layer. Hey, did you see that? It's a reconnaissance plane. Am I imagining things or is it getting warmer? No, you're not. In this layer, the stratosphere, the sun's energy is absorbed and so the average temperature increases. This absorption means that the stratosphere is extremely important for protecting us from solar radiation. Ozone molecules play a vital role in this process. They are concentrated in a thin layer throughout the stratosphere at an altitude of about 16 to 21 kilometers. This is what we know as the ozone layer. The stratosphere is drier and less dense than the troposphere. As you get nearer to an altitude of 50 kilometers, you are reaching the edge of the stratosphere. The temperature should have increased to about zero degrees Celsius. Have you seen a weather balloon yet, Balisa? The boundary between the stratosphere and the next layer is called the stratopause. The temperature is decreasing again. I must have reached the next layer. Yes, this layer is called the mesosphere. You will find... Look out! What are those? There are chunks of interplanetary rock called meteors that combust on impact with our atmosphere. Usually they burn out before reaching the Earth's surface and we see them as shooting or falling stars. If they don't, the effects can be devastating. As a matter of fact, there are some theories that suggest a meteor impact with Earth is what caused the extinction of dinosaurs. One of the best preserved examples of where a meteorite hit the Earth's surface is the Zwaying meteorite crater just north of the city of Tswane, South Africa. The temperature at the edge of the mesosphere is about minus 98 degrees Celsius at an altitude of 88 kilometers. You should be nearing the mesopause and entering the thermosphere. Can you predict what the temperature trend will be in this layer? You should have noticed that there is a pattern here. We've been describing the atmosphere according to whether there is a constant increase or constant decrease of temperature. 
I see. The temperature's rising again. The thermosphere is the outer layer of the Earth's atmosphere. This layer is heated by the sun first, and its temperature depends entirely on solar activity. If the sun is very active, the particles in the thermosphere can reach temperatures of up to 1,500 degrees Celsius. Interestingly, a normal thermometer would not read these high temperatures because the particles are just too far apart. The powerful solar radiation has an ionizing effect on the particles in this region. This means that it breaks up some of the particles to form charged ions and free-floating electrons. For this reason, the thermosphere is also called the ionosphere. The large number of free electrons in the ionosphere creates a barrier to electromagnetic waves radiating from Earth. They cannot pass through to space but are bounced back to Earth. Because of this, radio signals from Earth are bounced off the ionosphere, allowing radio communication over long distances. You should also remember that atoms in an excited state give off energy in the form of light as electrons move back and forth between energy levels. This causes the mysterious and beautiful light display in the thermosphere that we call the auroras. We can't see them in South Africa as they are only visible at high latitudes near the poles. Look, there goes the space shuttle. Where do I go from here? Actually, it may be time to turn around. There's no official boundary or pause at the edge of the thermosphere. Beyond an altitude of about 550 kilometers, you'll be entering the exosphere. This is the region where the atmosphere merges with interplanetary gases or space. Hey, <laughs> welcome back to Earth. Now, why don't you help me analyze the data that we collected on the atmosphere by drawing a graph from the table. Okay, we've just seen that the atmosphere is divided into layers dependent on the temperature pattern. So we'll place temperature on the x-axis. Altitude is on the y-axis. We have the temperature at the start of the layer and the temperature at the end of the layer. Good. Now we draw the line that represents the temperature pattern in the atmosphere. Can you see the definite pattern of temperature decrease, increase, decrease, and then increase again? Well, I think then it's time for today's task. Draw a bar graph representing the percentage composition of gases in the atmosphere. In our next lesson, we will look at how our Earth's atmosphere was formed. See you then. Yeah.